Woke is, I think, actually losing a lot of favor right now over this demonstration. For example, queers for Palestine. Yeah. Sex workers for Palestine. Yeah. While there may be some, from a leftist perspective, some legitimate points that these people make and re legitimate reasons for solidarity, the average person on the street who sees this written on transparent paper, they see right through it. They think it's obvious, yeah. Yeah. obvious poppycock. And, yeah. and the, the people that are involved in this are super confused and, and just not thinking individuals. Hello and welcome to the Winston Marshall Show with me, Winston Marshall. Since October 7th, there have been weekly marches on the streets of central London, anti-Israel, pro-Palestine marches. Now, these marches, which I've witnessed myself, include, amongst others, radical, progressive, far-leftist types, you know, your Jeremy Corbyn's, your Socialist Worker Party types, and on the other hand, Hamas and Houthi sympathising Muslim groups. Now, there are others besides, but these two specific groups, the Red and the Green, have formed an unholy alliance. It's the Red-Green Alliance. The Red-Green Alliance is nothing new. In fact, Italian journalist Oriana Falacci wrote a whole chapter on the topic in a 2004 bestseller, The Force of Reason. She writes about how far-right Islamism meets far-left progressivism. I wanted to understand this topic and the history of this ideology and this convergence of ideologies deeper. So I sat down with writer, author, and expert in Marxism, neo-Marxism, post-modernism, critical theories, James Lindsay. James Lindsay and I sat down only a few weeks after October 7th, but seeing as these marches seem to be continuing and in some ways getting more extreme, this conversation feels just as relevant now as it, is, as it did back then. If you want to understand the, the ideology and the history of the ideology behind the Red-Green Alliance, you're going to find this conversation fascinating. So, without further ado, James Lindsay. Thank you for watching the Winston Marshall Show. Obviously, you've written uh, a lot about this stuff, but right now, or over the last month, We've seen not just here in London, but across your country, um, uh, we, massive protests uh, in response to what's going on in Israel and Gaza. Uh, but notably, hundreds of thousands of people are st claiming to be pro-Palestine, but I've been in their number. It is very anti-Israel. It is not critical of Hamas. And there seems to be, to me, a tie-in with some of the movements that you've been describing, and this comes out firstly with movements like Queers for Palestine. Sex workers for Palestine too. Sex workers for yeah, Palestine. Yeah, that's fun. And uh, then we're seeing on university campuses, Jewish buildings like at Cornell University in, in is that in New York, Cornell? Uh, yeah. And uh, Jewish students being locked in libraries, uh, buildings being uh, threatened. Um, I'm, I'm, oh, so it's it's not just wider society here, synagogues and schools of clients, but we're seeing it in the universities. And you've written a lot about the university. So I wondered if you might try and unpack that link, that this, the package deal yeah. of what queer theory and postmodernist theory and Marxist theory, cultural Marxism, that is now being lumped in with this Palestinian Hamas ideology. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, um, before we unpack the, the deep stuff, I, I just reference the moment we're going through. We all understand from 2020, we had our George Floyd moment globally or through the West. Anyway, now we're having our Gaza Floyd moment. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a strategic operation. It's written down. It came from Rules for Radicals. Uh, Saul Alinsky first articulated it. When was uh, that? And that would have been in 1970, plus or minus a year or two. Uh -huh. And uh, he says that your uh, enemy's reaction is your real action. This has been codified into left-wing activism through their kind of updated, expanded book based off of Rules for Radicals called Beautiful Trouble. And one of their key principles they devote an entire page to is your target's reaction is your real action. So in this case, an atrocity occurs in Israel. It's predictable that Israel is going to give a vigorous response. Uh, it's morally justified under self-defense that they give a vigorous response and the response lands viciously in many ways on Gaza and through the operations of Hamas which often hide behind human shields and so on we do have a number of casualties that are always tragic but in this case as a result of a deliberate evil but the 
the name of the game in this case is to use how Israel reacted as an impetus to a greater amount of activism. So the real action has now stimulated this, uh, the proper wording for it is counter-hegemonic move throughout the West. The Western hegemonic view is of Western liberal values and Republican democracies and all of this. And now we've got this completely other thing attacking it uh, to try to disrupt that um, cultural hegemony of Western values. If we agree, and I hope you agree with me, that the woke phenomenon has its roots in Marxist activism and thought, uh, disrupting the Western hegemony by any means is the goal of Western Marxism. So it's not a big surprise that they would have taken up this particular cause just on that superficial level. But the truth is that it goes far deeper than this. What's much deeper is that these uh, these movements have been at least co-belligerent, if not directly working together in many cases for essentially their entire history. I mean, we have a Judith Butler coming a video went viral of her, I think from the late 90s, I'm not quite sure of the date, uh, where she's saying that the Palestinian movement is itself a part of the global left, explaining the solidarity, she being the mother of queer theory, between queers and Palestine. Mm -hmm. Right now she's disclaimed, saying that no, she misspoke or was misunderstood or something now. Uh, now that there's this intense scrutiny, nobody quite knows what to do. But she very, very clearly said repeatedly, at least a couple of decades ago, that the Palestine thing and the woke left thing are really two parts of the same thing. There are deep philosophical reasons to accept that that's mostly true. Uh, there are deep historical reasons to accept that that's mostly true with some other influences, particularly the influence of Islam. So it's not a simple explanation, sure. unfortunately. But it is the case that in the 1950s, the Arab world was being flooded with thought from the European left. In particular, uh, Franz Fanon, who is the, the father of the decolonized concept. Or the, yeah, and his yeah right. One of his is the people who learned from him is Edward Said. Said yeah. yeah, and Said is the Oriental uh, Orientalism guy. He's the yeah. father, really, and meaningfully of postcolonial theory, uh, blending French Foucault with mm -hmm. with uh, Franz Fanon's you know explosive. He's from Martinique, but his explosive anti-colonialism that's also very kind of rooted in the same kind of. Um, oppressor versus oppressed dynamic, uh, claiming that the decolonization is always a violent phenomenon, that, de that the, 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 the colonized have a right. In fact, the first chapter of his book is called Concerning Violence, and the first sentence says that decolonization is always violent. So they have a right to reclaim not just their territory, but also their mental and psychological and, and kind of own spiritual wholeness through violence done to those who have, have colonized them, which Sartre in his foreword translates into literally, if you read the foreword, literally into a blood ritual uh, or a murder ritual of rebirth. That's simply because also in the Communist Manifesto, it's explicitly violent. It's calling that violence is a midwife of revolution. That's right. That's what Marx said. So, but at the same time, these same people now are saying silence is violence. So it depends on the topic, right? It depends on the issue, whether or not it's violent. So it's either yeah. violence if it's on the right side. but not That's right. That's right. So here's the issue, and we can come back to the specific context of, of Hamas and its, its origins in a moment. But the issue is that magic, complicated, hard word that I said a few minutes ago, which is hegemony. So silence that supports the hegemony is violence, but activism and screaming and yelling at buildings or whatever, or p literal physical violence up to and including murder and or genocide, if necessary, that disrupts the hegemony is not violence. In fact, it's resistance is not terrorism by any means, blah, blah, blah. It's entirely justified. So the relevant variable that people don't understand, largely because they don't understand the word, is hegemony. So what does that mean in like normal people's words? Western civilization and values are hegemonic throughout Western civilization. That means they are the ruling set of values and, and, and dispositions that Westerners tend to default to and hold. Anything that breaks or disrupts those violent, 
de making demands, occupying a train station, occupying you know hundreds of thousands, flooding the streets, last night the literal violence. Yeah. All of that is not only acceptable but necessary because it disrupts the Western hegemony. Anything that upholds the Western hegemony, however, silence is violence when you don't speak up against it. Mm -hmm. So silence in the face, they would actually say that silence in the face, like not standing up for not just Palestine, but Hamas, that is violence. Mm -hmm. So it's not the issue. It's the direction of the issue, according to leftist politics. So there's like a couple of things that jump on there. One of them is that how is it that Jews have, a minority group who in the West for thousands of years have, have suffered, endured, suffered pogroms, obviously the Holocaust, just, and, but now, again, they're no longer seen as a minority, even though they are a minority. And I think in Britain, there's under 200,000 Jews. Uh, it, there's far fewer, I mean, if you want to talk about real ethnic, religious minority groups, they are very much one of the smallest ones, and yet they're not counted as part, it's almost like they're considered, I guess, part of Western civilization. They are the hegemony now. Yeah, that's right. So, but is that maybe a, a success of, of post-war thought that, that, that Judaism has been integrated into Western civilization? Sure, yeah. Well, I mean, I want to you know, compliment you because you're not thinking like a leftist. Um, uh, That's this a simple fact. I actually had the, the privilege of speaking with a very friendly and thoughtful leftist on this issue last night. There are really three answers to the question that you're asking. Uh, I wrote about two of them. Um, Three years ago, you know, roughly this week, in an essay titled Critical Race Theory's Jewish Problem. And so the three answers are, first of all, what the gentleman I spoke with last night, who identifies openly as a Marxist, I'm not uh, mislocating him by saying he's a Marxist. I'm not speculating. He said it clearly. Uh, he's proud of it. It's not a point of embarrassment for him. What was his name? Um, was this a public thing or a private thing? It was public. It was on Unheard. Okay. And I... I slept since then. I apologize. Okay. I wish I remember. He's a very friendly man. Uh, we had a great conversation before and after, or during and after, um, mm -hmm. but I'm slipping my mind on okay. this spot. So he's an uh, artist and he... But yes. So he, he, um, he said the facts on the ground of today. In other words, the historical context has changed. The Jews, he was explaining, have been historically not just marginalized, but oppressed uh, recipients of violence. I mean, tremendous violence. And he acknowledges all of this. But since, you know, sometime in the past handful of decades, really since the 1970s and 80s, the facts on the ground, as he phrased it, have changed. Mm -hmm. They're very wealthy. They're very well established. They're very well accepted in Western societies, whereas Muslims are not, for example. They live in Israel, which is a powerful first world nation with an incredible military and nuclear weapons, whereas uh, the Arab world around it is rather backwards. In fact, mm -hmm. third world conditions. This is, in fact, the, the concept that, that segues into the more philosophical answer, but his very kind of utilitarian answer is, well, Jews are privileged now, mm -hmm. if we boil it down, because they materially, their circumstances so, have changed. Sorry, that's old school anti-Semitism. Like, that, 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 oh, this gets worse. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, the, 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 this all gets worse. So that segues into this idea that Israel is this powerful settler, settler colonialist object that has moved into the Arab world and occupied its territory unjustly through military force in the wake of World War II. And this is uh, supposed to you know, justify the Nakba and all of this. And this post-colonial reading, which is the Fanon and the Sartre and the, the Said that we were just talking about a moment ago, this, these intellectual currents that are shared by the university's professors and students both in the West, these uh, ideas see... Israel is an illegitimate occupier, a powerful force that has stepped in and brought the, the colonizing world into the colonized region. Mm -hmm. And so the post-colonial leftist logic says that what they've done is illegitimate and remains illegitimate. And when you couple that with their now increased power and standing, that makes them a wholly you know, oppressive object or symbolic of oppression in the area. So that's two of the reasons, the post-colonial reason, the facts on the ground. But the third is actually that the leftist current and in intersectional thought, critical race theory and post-colonial kind of together here, uh, is that there's a book. It's just a title to tell you the title of the book. The book is from 1998 or 9. It's by a woman named Karen Brodkin. 
and the book is called How Jews Became White Folks mm. and What This Means About Race in America. Mm. And she tells the story that in through the 1950s and 60s in the United States, Jews, uh, there were civil rights issues that were fighting for equality, acceptance, acceptance into colleges, equal standing, standing in society, not to be discriminated against. And she claims, in fact, that not only did they achieve admission into the ranks of whiteness, mm -hmm. but they also did so by engaging in acts of racism against people of color. To the point where, she goes on to explain, they've risen through the ranks of cultural whiteness to the point where they are now, whether it's in film, whether it's in, you know, uh, you know, directing and in, in, in producing and in so many different industries, they've become the setters of white culture. In other words, they've usurped privilege and then risen to the point of, set, of, of, of being the, mm -hmm. the controllers of, of what defines mm -hmm. that privilege, which is, as you were saying, literally, definitionally old school anti-Semitism. Well, yeah, I remember living in, in America when white privilege was every other sentence contained white, white privilege. And one of the things that, well, two of the things that immediately came, came uh, urged me about it was firstly, if you're gonna play that intersectionality game, anti-Semitism is the end of that game. Secondly, privilege in this concept is exactly what was going on in 1930s. That's right. Uh, a, a group was perceived to be a, a, a powerful impression because some of them were at top of certain uh, uh, or various uh, different uh, industries but they ignored that there were countless on the breadline and right. countless poor Jews. In, and so now broadening out further, it seems to me that the lesson we have not learned from that period is exactly what's coming out in postmodernism, which is, and, and this is the same for the Hutus and the Tutsis, the same for the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, the same way that the Bolsheviks perceived there was a high price. You, you, you identify one group as being oppressors because some of them appear more powerful and that that power is uh, as a consequence of uh, not of competence or ability or skill or intelligence but rather oppression and so now again not only what's happening in america what it, seems, what it seems to me that's happening in israel is because israel in the same period in that period of time since its formation has been so competent and diligent and hard working they appear now as oppressors because they're the more powerful nation in in that yep. region when actually which is seemed to me fits totally in with that old school and do you think that's a, a fair analysis yeah it reproduces the the logic of it precisely even when it doesn't have to do specifically with jews another piece that often gets overlooked here is so we're talking about bad german ideas and more bad german ideas really at the end of the day but one of these very bad german ideas is this folkish Mm. that a nation or an ethnicity is, is defined by some kind of a folkish uh, camaraderie or folkish uh, solidarity, as a matter of fact. So this is where you get this idea that a few of the people who are de facto members of a certain group, they're Jewish or whatever happens to be, rise to the top of certain aspects of society, that the entire group is therefore mm -hmm. privileged or overrepresented. Because you're thinking now of the entire religion or social group, you know, the black community, the white community, whatever these things are supposed to represent, as though they represent, you know, a nation, a, a folk. And this folkishness is exactly the same tool that the anti-Semitism of the Nazi regime weaponized. I mean, mm -hmm. what was their slogan, right? It was Ein Reich, you know, one, one Reich, uh, Ein Volk, mm -hmm. one people, mm -hmm. Ein Führer, one, one father or one leader. And so... That was the idea, but the folk right there. What did we drive? Volkswagen. Mm -hmm. What is Volkswagen? It was, it was a Nazi invention, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead and cancel Volkswagen. That was a that was a Nazi invention. Definitely. But it it was the car of the people. the German people yeah. specifically, and that's what Hitler was able to appeal to. Is well, the Germans are dispossessed because this other group of people who are alien to us have usurped our standing and our privilege. And so we're going to drive out or destroy the alien that has mm -hmm. stolen our glory. That's at its kind of most fundamental boiled down uh, aspect, what's going on with the race hygiene aspect of, without getting into the esoteric parts of it, of, of the Nazi ideology. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are other pieces, the national socialism, the progressivism, the, the building of the perfect society through these means. There are other aspects. I don't want to oversimplify Nazi ideology but that really this folkishness in that there's a alien folk who have not only risen to positions of power and authority but have usurped and stolen our privilege 
uh, or stolen privilege in society, and then they're using it to exclude the natural inheritors of that, the German folk. Mm-hmm. That is the resentment, the the cross cultural resentment dialogue that creates that level of hatred, that level of tribal zealotry, which we unfortunately saw a 21st century or 2020s analog of pour out by the hundred thousand in the street here on Saturday. And it's supposed to be each Saturday here in London um, until I don't know what point that is intended to stop. Very, especially to remember Sunday, the Sunday coming up and, and it has the, the, the more it goes on and more it seems to be antagonizing people who only this morning I woke up to see that uh, someone had been arrested for um, in, in London had been arrested for posting a video critical about Palestine flags on Bethnal Green Road in, in East East London, all the while on Whitehall, where our national monuments like the Cenotaph are being defaced with with uh, flags and people on, on soapbox, essentially calling for jihad against the Jews, but the police leave them alone. It's, the police seems to be completely captured. I mean, I appreciate these are British issues, and, and as an American, maybe it's, it's shocking for you, but it's, it is happening in your country somewhat as well it's a western wide yes i mean on on saturday there was the giant protest and rally here in london there was also a very large almost comparable size protest and rally to the same effect Mm -hmm. in dallas texas so these similar things are happening in the u.s i don't know that there's a similar level of tolerance from the american people as there is from the british people Mm -hmm. um but similar things are occurring uh, our university campuses, I think, are even wilder than yours. Yeah. Our, our young people have been much more thoroughly brainwashed by this woke solidarity, this drive to pick up that uh, strong, you know, whatever the left is doing overall is what I'm doing too. Uh, these poor, uh, you know, Gazans or Palestinians or really Hamas are oppressed by virtue of the settler colonialist attitudes of white western hegemonic Mm. values being imposed on them through military force through israel to create an open air prison blah 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 Mm. blah. right and so you hear these 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 things being said this is powerfully manifest on our college campuses to the point where i think it's causing um a second great awakening in the united states right now to the to the nature of woke the Mm. first being not when george floyd himself died in the aftermath But when all of a sudden George Floyd dying overrode the COVID restrictions, Mm -hmm. racial justice protests somehow don't communicate. You can't catch a virus during those or something. Uh, People saw that something is badly wrong at that moment. There's a great awakening occurred. Uh, Another great awakening is occurring now that whatever this thing is that woke is, is not what people thought it was. And uh, not to put you on the spot because it's, it's a very common thought, but to think that this is a new and recent phenomenon is, is people are, where has woke gone? How has it turned to this? But the point is actually that it's actually always been this. It woke his three years ago. I wrote the essay explaining critical race theory and post-colonial theory predict what we see, mm-hmm. having just happened in the last few weeks. How much of a priority is is post-colonial theory? Is it, is it something that's at the forefront? That it's it's come up now again. Obviously, I've heard this word decolonization. We've talked about it already in, in this conversation. Is is this uh, something that is now the priority? It's is it? Are they serious about? It, it, it starts with Israel. When does it, where does it go next? So the, the thing is, is, and this is very different to different contexts, because what we're dealing with is a suite of theories, critical race theory, queer theory, um, post-colonial theory, so on and so forth. Uh, they are each adapted to different cultural contexts more and less successfully. Critical race theory, for example, is very successful or was very successful for a number of years in the United States. I think it's been exposed and is not successful now, whereas in Britain it always seemed a little off. It, this it seems very American. Why are you? Do, what are you talking about? You know, and so it doesn't quite adapt to the context as well here. It does adapt, but not as well. On the other hand, because of the legacies of colonialism throughout Europe and Britain, mm-hmm. it's much more susceptible. Australia has been under the the, the thumb of post colonial analysis very very firmly. Canada has actually been also with the way that they deal with the issues around uh, indigenous peoples rather significantly. Uh, these things are more powerful here in Europe because of European colonialism being their target mm-hmm. and the reservoir of guilt that, that many Europeans feel for some of the abuses and, and harms that were, were perpetrated through colonialism. It, I love, it, it, it is a kind of paradox there as well, because in America, 
there's a lot of emphasis given on the indigenous people, but that doesn't work in Europe. Right. It turns out people, are white. white people. Yeah. Most right. Of who, you know, struggle and right. the vast waves of white working classes. Right. And so, but there isn't that consideration given. There. So it's oriented. It kind of translates, comes out differently. It means taking in immigrants from these other boxes. So, so I'll be, I'll predict like a virologist. How is the COVID-19 vi virus going to evolve next or whatever, right? Well, I don't know about that, but I do know how this virus is going to evolve next through our Western context, because this is something we actually have in common. Europe, Great Britain, and, and the United States across the board, Canada, also, I think Australia, I know less about the Australian context than this, maybe not Australia, but we've taken in waves and waves and waves and waves of what we're referring to as immigrants. Um, some of those are legal, especially over here. Many of them in the United States are not. I think we're going to see an adaptation that kind of mixes post-colonial themes and critical race themes into a new kind of monster. It does exist in the literature, but nobody pays much attention to it, of an of a immig immigration theory rooted in critical theory. So what we might call critical immigration theory. So the relevant thing isn't going to be indigeneity or skin color, which, as you said, didn't take off that well uh, over here. It will be what is your and this will this will be on both sides of the ocean. What is your attitude toward the migrants that have now come to your country or the immigrants, depending on what their status happens to be in terms of uh, citizenship or legality? That's going to be that these people who have come into our country suffer a suite of oppressions based on the fact that they're immigrants and the seeds for that are in the original CRT literature, mm -hmm. the paper mapping the margins from 1991 from Kimberly Crenshaw, where intersectionality really got its legs put under it. It's a little bit of an introduction that describes what's going on, a conclusion that describes what's going on. And the rest of it is stories, kind of case studies of, well, here's this problem where you have to take race and sex into consideration together. Here's this other one. And several of the stories say that you have to take race, sex and immigration status into account. Together. So what we're going to see is a shift toward what looks very much like critical race theory that draws many themes from the post-colonial canon, but it's going to be specifically geared toward immigration status as a axis of oppression. This is how the, this will be, I think, the next big wave now that this is kicked off. Uh, we will see that the Europeans and Americans have a obligation to see the immigrants into their country, legal or otherwise, as an oppressed minority who has to be so treated this way. Challenge that, because I, I, although I, I can perceive that, I think it's actually only specific immigrants. And I'll give you an example in Britain. So last year we had 600,000 net migrants, of whom I think something like 100, 120,000 were Hong Kongers, something like 100, 150,000 were Ukrainians. I don't think that they'll fall into that. You're correct. You're completely correct. No, no, no. You're theory. so it's actually more specific. So it has they to be. they will be held up as model immigrants or some term like this. You are one hundred percent correct. This will be I, well, for that, well. Firstly, Ukrainians they're white and Christian. Hong Kongers of them who have come over here, I think about half are Christian. Uh, even though uh, Hong Kong is not half Christian, so th th there's a lot. They're a lot easier to assimilate because the foundations of their I guess uh, values are, are much closer to British, sure. British values. So, but, I, but sorry, but, and that's the same variable from the beginning. The the migrants or immigrants who come in who are likely to, through their behaviors, actions, activities, support Western hegemony, are going to be considered good migrants or whatever as a pejorative. But who's going to be considering them good migrants? There, that's a that's an evil term. That's a that's a pejorative term. Uh -huh. So a white person who says, "Oh, I'm an anti-racist now. I'm on your side. I'm an ally." That's a good white. They're a white that's going along with it. So nobody accuses them of being a racist anymore. Mm. The model minority is a is a thing that's used to attack Asian Americans in particular and say, "Well, yeah, they're a minority group. You know, whether East Asian or South Asian, but they behave well according to white culture. So the whites give them." model you know better status or whatever so they're white adjacent they're white or whatever adjacent. so yeah. when i say that they're model minorities that's what the left or model immigrants i should say that, that is a pejorative term that the left will use to say they're not acting in solidarity with the counter hegemonic migrants so the answer is that the immigrants and migrants who are counter -hege hegemonic will be lifted up by the left through a critical theory of immigration and everybody else the people that are the already the citizens, the native inhabitants, and the immigrants who are trying to do it the legal way or who, who are, are generally um, 
integrated into the hegemonic Western or British context, they will all be the enemy. Well, the insidiousness of that uh, uh, philosophy is that incentivize incentivizes that you don't integrate. That's right. Because so it, that which supports Western values, mm -hmm. bad. That which disrupts Western values, good. That's the whole logic of the whole thing. So that's how the that's how the lines will get carved through all these different groups. That's the entire. When I said you don't think like a leftist, that's the logic right there. Mm -hmm. Is that if it if it cuts against Western values or disrupts them or challenges them or uh, strains the application of them, like welfare or whatever, gets strained by bringing in a large influx of people who need it. Uh, well, that'll be upheld. So that, is that right at the core then? Being anti-Western? Yes. Is that the very core of it all? That is the very you core went to, of it all. To, to sizzle it all down to one phrase of, you know, all this postmodern stuff, little critical theory stuff, uh, uh, critical immigration theory. Yeah. All of it comes down to is it has to be anti, if it's anti-Western. That's right. That's yeah. as simple as that. Their view, their worldview is as simple as that the Western civilization has imposed itself illegitimately on the entire world dispossessed everybody else for its own benefit, expropriated, uh, exploited, uh, estranged, all of the alienated, all the bad words. It has taken advantage of the whole rest of the world for its own benefit and gain. This is a Marxist theory of, of, uh, of understanding this phenomenon. And therefore, they are intrinsically the oppressor. They are the jailer of humanity to their own benefit. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they must be resisted, dismantled, deconstructed, whichever the tool uh all the time, everywhere. So anything that supports that in the left's view is good, like Hamas. Mm -hmm. Anything that, that would, would, would support it and hold it up is bad. Uh, and so Ukrainian immigrants will, like you said, and the Hong Kongers are not going to get the benefits of a critical immigration theory unless they declare allyship through the identity of uh, oppressed immigrant. So look, you've played this out, critical immigration theory. Is there a, um, a positive way out? Do, how do we how do we integrate into the Western story the the aspects where the leftists, let's say the woke, are, are correct, where there are injustice injustices? How do we? Is there a hopeful way out of this? Or are, I mean, are you a pessimist? Are you, are you I'm an optimist. Like, you're an optimist. Of, so can you make me an optimist? Yeah. Well, the first mistake is that we don't try to incorporate where the woke have been right about. But anything, because when they are, they are often right with many of their critiques, but this is irrelevant. This is not a leftist mindset. This is a liberal mindset, mm. right? So what the, the, that leads you to do is absorb some of their mentality. They operate with a fundamentally different operating system. Our operating system says, well, let's see where they're right. Let's see where they're wrong. Their operating system says, let's see where we can infiltrate, subvert, and turn the thing upside down. So... Even when their critique points at a correct fact, it points at it for the wrong reasons and for the wrong purposes. It, it analyzes incorrectly while identifying genuine problems. So what you actually have to do is to steal that analysis from them. You have to give the liberal analysis of the problem separate to what they are offering. They don't automatically get a seat at the table because they've said something where there's an actual injustice and say, well, yeah. No, you can read them and you can take that and think through it on on the liberal terms and they don't even have to be included in the conversation that's a, that, that's how they enter in and subvert uh the optimism is that we this isn't the first our first rodeo as we say in the west right or in in, in america i guess not just the west but, you know we've got horses and stuff <laughs> this isn't this ain't our first rodeo and we'd saw Operation George Floyd. Now we see Operation Gaza Floyd. We've seen critical race theory. So I can lay out to you and we can, you picking up on it very quickly and, and nuancing it correctly, almost automatically, how critical immigration theory will play out, mm -hmm. which means we can identify the manipulation in advance and prevent it from having its capacity that it needs to create the mass movement that becomes the problem that we fear it could become. This is going to, I think, in Britain, you are a little further behind the curve of understanding technically what's known as dialectical political warfare, but we're all starting to catch on to how they play. The Americans are catching on very quickly. I'm writing a guide to dealing with it presently, but if it's, we can... So that's cool political warfare, kind of what you've been describing in this conversation. Yeah, all, all along. Okay. And so when, so, you know, you're either with the, the left's favorite immigrants or you're an enemy of the people. That's 
now it's, it's a dialectical split and then they create the conflict around it to create a synthesis where we, we transform our laws to accommodate something that we wouldn't have accommodated in the past mm -hmm. or give up our liberties or something. This is, that's exactly what it is. And so we have the ability to identify these things in advance and therefore not get taken by surprise. The energy that they actually need is, is called reflexive energy, which is, oh, you've put on a black square on your profile. I have to put a black square. Everybody's putting on a black square. What is that? It's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. It's the current thing. Everybody's waving this flag. We're all supposed to wave this flag. We're all supposed to wave whether it's the Ukraine flag, the Palestinian flag, the pride flag, whichever flag. Oh, we're all BLM flag. We're all doing this now. That energy where, oh, this is just the thing everybody's doing and we all got to participate. And it's almost like being in a trance or a, mm. what was it? Mass formation psychosis or something. You can expose that this is a likely consequence of a logic that will get introduced and that people become much less susceptible to getting caught up in the wave. Mm -hmm. And if they don't get caught up in the wave, the energy of the thing actually fizzles. The movement falls on its face. We've seen that happen kind of at increasing speed with different leftist incursions into our society. And I'm, so I'm hopeful that because we've had a few rounds of this now, we've, we've been, if we think of it as a mind virus, as some people say, We've got a little vaccine in us, or we've got a little previous infection, so, actually, antibodies well, to well, it. Maybe not so helpful if I'm just for that long of, okay, yeah. is it, as well as the sort of the flag shaggers and the, the ones who yeah, yeah. love it. There's also an, another faction that, in, in, in antithesis that's grown who will oppose whatever the current thing is, whatever the current thing is. Yes. So that's become an unthinking opposition who will see Israel flag take the opposite, see Ukraine flag take the opposite, see BLM take the opposite. And, and that I think is, is acting exactly the same way. And so it could quite easily be that we end up going just more and more extreme and further away from each other. Oh yeah, your target's reaction is, is your real action. So again, this is, a di this is a dynamic that can be described and it can pull people back to reason. I like that you actually used the, the word antithesis mm -hmm. here because I don't know if you know that that is the key word for the yeah, for the dialectical analysis. That is part of the objective. You do need that uh, that reaction so that all of a sudden people can step in and say, this has gotten way out of control. So here's here's a solution. Let's start doing facial tracking of everybody like they do in China. And we're going to suppress all of this. That's what it's, but that's what, that's a black pill. I mean, you're not presumably you're not a fun in favor of. No, no, no. It's, it's a black. No, obviously not. <laughs> I. That's it a solution. Is, it is a white pill to know that the play is coming beforehand. If we're in a you know sports match or whatever, and you know exactly what play I'm going to run, you'll put your people in my, my way and block me. But if you have no idea and I fool you, I'll run around you and, and score the goal or whatever. So in this case, we are starting to learn their playbook. We're starting to learn that these are society-wide manipulations. We're starting to recognize, for example, as many people on Saturday when I was out in the, the Palestinian protest oh in london you were out there in london i walked up the strand the wrong way through the crowd of palestinian the signs the flags everything coming the mm -hmm. pro-palestinian or hamas or whatever they are people i was straight you know even in the the middle section there the the part way through the road but it's a sidewalk in the middle uh, yeah. i walked up the wrong way up the street right through the crowd what did you uh, see? thousands of people who just went around me you know, holding flags holding signs yelling beating drums i saw a was gigantic... it positive or negative do you think that the media coverage saying that you know on the one hand if i was saying it's there's one group of people saying it's it's all pro hamas uh, from the river to the sea i mean i, I have my own opinions there because i also saw some of it but uh, there's also other saying it's completely peaceful there's a very fringe amount of people uh, who are you know pro hamas but yeah, the majority of it are, are peaceful pro palestine what was your take? there i saw some of both for sure I saw some of both, but what I also saw, and this was the point I wanted to raise with it, was that every tube stop, every place where there was a big enough intersection or a, you know one of the bridges coming down, where people would have been pouring in to the to join the protest, there was a tent for the British social uh, what is the social socialist worker party. socialist workers party, yeah, uh, UK. So they had their materials. They had printed the signs that people were carrying. In many cases, they're handing out their materials. They were putting their analysis. Now I'm not saying that they coordinated. The event, but what you, they were they were obviously the happy allies. They're very happy allies. So what what was my point though is that I wasn't the only person who noticed that that seemed a bit odd. That that means that something other than hey we actually just care about the plight of people in Gaza 
is what this is about. And so where there were people who were peaceful and there were people who were largely, if you want my impression of what I saw walking face on into the crowd, was a lot of mindless activity. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who were going along with a very big crowd that was going this way because this is the way that you go. Mm -hmm. I did not see a lot of thoughtful activity. Most of the speech was chance. Chance require no thought. This is one of the things that I think is why it's been such an effective ideology, which I do believe to be not only completely wrong, but also evil. At, 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 uh, I, I state that, but probably obvious, but I think that um, is that it's, it's so low def and simple that it's so easy to take on that the masses can take it on very quickly without having to look very deep into the complexities of the issue. Sorry. And so you can take on a position and, and that appeals then to huge groups of people right. who don't have to investigate all the, the oppressor oppressed narrative. That's, that's its power. Is it? But this is why a I'm simple way of explaining everything. But it's also intrinsically dissatisfying. It's, it's not satisfying. Dissatisfying to you. No, dissatisfying but, to the people who participate in it. it. But isn't, isn't complexity dissatisfying for the people? Like it's, well, perhaps, but sloganeering is, is empty. Even if you read the Marxist literature, they complain about slogan, 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 slogan all the time. It gets tiring. There's a phenomenon called activist fatigue. Again, this isn't our first rodeo. It does catch people up, but it's like eating fast food or eating sugar. It doesn't nourish you to participate in these things. So it doesn't sustain well over the long term. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that it's not that people crave complexity. Many people are not particularly fans of complexity, but they do want to get beneath the surface unless they're just, you know, what do we call in the U.S.? We call them bandwagoners. I'm not sure mm -hmm. to use the same term here. Uh, yeah, we do. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I feel as though when you see this mindlessness is not nourishing to the human spirit at all. And when you see this very mindless thing, and having just spoken with Africa Burkout in the in the in the art conference just now, uh, is you know where she's had her eyes open and come. So down Afro Brook Brook had this uh, essay she wrote about five years ago. Why I'm leaving the cult of wokeness. And That's right. I was with you when she came up. She's an old friend of mine. She came up to you and said you were one of the first people to share that article, and that article got read, I think, five million times. It's a huge yeah. moment for. Uh, her and, and I guess the mo uh, yeah the movement or against the movement and uh, so she was thanking you for that yeah that's right and um, so sorry. no but the, the point is is that once you there's a moment that the mindlessness she, yeah she was zipping out becomes she, unsatisfying yeah. and you zip out yeah. and once that happens you don't go back in you don't you might get sucked into the other pole which I think we should be pull, pointing out is a is a is a dark temptation but you don't go back in. And I think that what we are now on is this, you know, the, the theme of the conference is that the arc of, you know, history bends toward justice, which I have some heebie-jeebies about myself as a phrase. But the arc... I think that is the, the conversation here. I think that's the fact that history bends towards justice is, is the fallacy of, of well, libertarians and, and, and... Yeah, I don't think it does. Yeah, no, no. In fact, I don't... I think human nature stays absolutely the same. Yeah, yeah I think so too. And that... The, 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 history itself doesn't have a defined purpose as such mm -hmm. uh you know a history as history separate from 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 other understandings but the point is that you can zip you you can drop out of this and you don't go back in and i think that we are in the arc of woke is bending toward people who are sick of this mm -hmm. this is a different issue and it might try to make islam sexy or something like that but woke is i think actually losing a lot of favor right now over this demonstration for example queers for palestine yeah sex workers for palestine yeah while there may be some from a leftist perspective some legitimate points that these people make and re legitimate reasons for solidarity the average person on the street who sees this written on transparent paper they see right through it they think it's obvious yeah. obvious poppycock and yeah. it, the, the, the people that are involved in this are super confused uh and and just not thinking individuals mm -hmm. and i just see the arc compared to I've been speaking up about this for a long time, see the arc just bending away from people being satisfied with woke to the point where I even mentioned this last night, speaking with the, the communist fellow on, on unheard that I'm very worried about the, the antipole, as you might put it, yeah. the, the lure to a fascist response and desperation. Mm. But at the same time, I'm cheered by seeing how many people are starting to see that it's not, it may not even be necessary. It's almost like the, the clouds are parting a little and a little bit of light of 
uh, you know, not necessarily specifically classical liberalism, but these generally liberal Western values are starting to shine through a little again. It's shining through, and, and it's the common sense, you know, silent majority. We hear that term all the time. But uh, you, given what happens with the authoritarian response, uh, you know, the face, uh, uh, you know, s- s- being screened everywhere we go. But what does that positive response look like? I, I still haven't understood how the the synthesis. Well, <laughs> the, you know, of where the pr- the primary can be hopeful for. Yeah, the primary way that it works out. I mean, there's different domains. There's institutional and there's cultural. Uh, the cultural domain that it works works out in is woke, as the kids say, becomes cringe. Somebody starts articulating this woke stuff. I notice now that if you just said some woke stuff to me right now, right now, I roll my eyes so hard I'd almost black out like a fourteen year old girl. I'm just over it. I don't want to hear it. Oh, of course that's what you say. It's so programmatic. You don't have a single original thought. Mm-hmm. And when this starts to become the vibe of the mainstream, like really you're doing this again, mm-hmm. or we're still talking about that. Then all of a sudden the cultural shift starts to shift back toward let's get back to normal. That's what your average person, they're not liberal values this or that. They might talk about liberal democracy or something, but let's get back to normal. Like this is some BS. We're going to be nice to people. We're not going to put up with it. We're not going to be treated like doormats. We're not just going to give in every time somebody throws a fit. I keep hearing the woke referred to as toddlers by people on stage here, by people in the, everywhere. So this is, as the kids say, woke is becoming cringe which is, yeah. is, is so, the cultural aspect. Institutionally, it's harder. That's going to require... Can I push back on that? Can we come back to the... Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. Where, where it's becoming cringe is, let's say, to the, the let's say, the silent majority groups. But a bigger problem here is that, and as we've seen with the, the that you were at the these uh, protests, 100,000 people, those, those people are, they have a completely different worldview. And so, and they are coming in into the West uh, there are big minority groups of them, and so that's almost like that. I don't think they're woke. I think no, 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 no. The Muslims, are, the Muslims in the pro, in the crowd are not woke. Exactly, they're not woke at all. Well, that's the, the poor the narrative of a, 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 a slogan like "queers for for Palestine." Correct. So that, so what you are describing is how the kind of white liberal girls on the on the Upper East Side they're going to maybe wake up to this stuff. But I don't know if it's a completely different thing for those kind, the, those other communities. So I will mention that I'm much more concerned about Britain than I am about the United States and Canada, at least in the next however many years, the short to, med- to midterm. Uh, you may end up having to take a page out of our book, in fact, to, to turn this around, because there will have to be an assertion of that set of values that defines the cultural hegemony that has, has been Great Britain or has been Europe or has been the West um americans are much more proud and prone to do that you know we're i'm wearing a shirt that says american masculinity for god's sake right now it, we're like hell yeah america i was in super left-wing connecticut the other day wearing this shirt and all these very obviously woke people complimented my shirt huh. because it's oh yeah america you know so we're not quite so uh apologetic about about our culture as i mm. see over here but when that apology, even, even conservatives here um, are apologetic about their patriotism, yes, and it was a different. So, so that also can change. But I think you're in a much worse spot than we are in the U.S. And it will require saying these are our values, and we're not apologetic about our values, um, and starting to work out the practical side, which will mostly be institutionally worked out. And that's why the institutional problem is another one that's more challenging. Uh, I'm more. I'm. I am. I would, I think, if I lived here, be more concerned about the immigrant situation mm-hmm. than I am about the young people. But as an American, I'm more worried about the brainwashing of the young generation mm-hmm. being so heavily pulled this way. But the, what we see in the statistics in the U.S., at least, is that young men are now throwing off that indoctrination, whereas young women are still fairly well caught up in it. Mm-hmm. The young men in the United States right now are the most conservative generation or cohort since something like World War II. Mm-hmm. They're incredibly sick of this. They're incredibly tired of it. They roll their eyes when they hear it. They don't want to hear it. Um, and they're not ashamed to, you know, say these are our values. And and I don't know if you swear on your podcast. Ever, swear away. But as we say in the South, if you don't like it, that's called too fucking bad. <laughs> right. And so that that attitude, actually, the, I do like the British politeness. I think it's charming and mm. it's, it's occasionally annoying. But as an American... Like, no, really, just say what you mean and stop tiddly-widdly around or whatever kind of word you would use for this. But 
setting that a bit aside to say, no, 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 no. We have good values. We have a, a long and, and good history. We're not ashamed of it anymore. It's going to be a, a turning point moment for the country. I hope it comes to it. Uh, but without that, you're in trouble. Well, on that note, James, I'd love to speak to you again because there's so many great things you, you write about and, uh, and think about and you're one of the leading voices and thinkers in this topic, but it's been a great pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for taking the time. And uh, where can listeners find you and uh, uh, what, what are you up to next that they should be excited about? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, it's been a real pleasure getting to know you a little bit and talking. Um, so you can find me on my website, which is newdiscourses.com. And the podcast is called the New Discourses Podcast. You can find the links to it there. And then I'm on social media at, at Conceptual James. You can also, if you want the toned down version, go to at New Discourses, which is strictly professional, way less fun, uh, much, much less fun. But so those are the those are the spots. Newdiscourses.com, at Conceptual James, at New Discourses. And it's on YouTube at New Discourses as well. Uh, what am I working on now? I'm working on actually a couple of books at once, maintaining the podcast. I've got a book coming out with another gentleman I hope soon it hasn't really been fully announced but I'll mention we're going to tackle the issue of queer theory and education I think that's going to make a very big difference mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned earlier that I'm working on a book about dialectical political warfare I'll continue speaking about uh, the influence of communism and Maoist uh, thought and insurgency mm -hmm. through the western world um, I may do a book on that I don't want to step on my friend Shee Van Fleet who just wrote a wonderful book called Mao's America uh, and I don't want to step on that. Is that already out? That it, that came out uh, two days ago or three days ago. Oh, so yeah, okay. it just came out. And it's it's wonderful. Is, uh, the, is is Maoism in America something I should be concerned about? I hadn't even thrown that well, grenade into my yeah. No, the word sense. the word intersectionality is the modern Western word for Maoist uh, activism. So not just in America. Wow. Yeah. So having attempted to white pill me, you're now black pilling me. No, 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 no. <laughs> because we're naming these things now. We are not lost in the, you have to remember that cancer is scarier when you don't know you have it. We have diagnoses. We're developing treatments. I, it's a, it's an optimistic moment. Yeah. I agree with that. James Lindsay, a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's all mine. Thank you for watching the Winston Marshall show. If you enjoyed that episode, well, I encourage you to like, share, and subscribe. You can also find us on all podcast outlets if you want just the audio. And, of course, on winstonmarshall.co.uk. Thanks for listening.